what we left off there in the 13th verse of the 11th chapter of Revelation, and that is where it speaks of a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell and 7,000 persons were killed by the earthquake and the rest became frightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. Well, as I mentioned previously, um, some of the things that happen here are um, described in a way that should evoke the death of Christ. And that is when the death of the two witnesses who died in the same place where Jesus, their Lord, was impaled, namely in Sodom and in Egypt, spiritually speaking. And I, I briefly mentioned the significance of that. And then after three and a half days, they stand up on their feet, evoking the fact that Christ was in the tomb for parts of three days, and then he stood on his feet, which is what resurrection means, to stand up. Uh, but what about uh, this great earthquake? There was a great earthquake when Jesus died, was there not? And it, in fact, it ejected bodies from the memorial tombs, which is a very strange passage in the Bible, but uh, some people think that the dead were raised at that point, but that couldn't be. Uh, it is known that some earthquakes are so violent that crypts containing corpses are uh, burst, and there you have it. But what about the tenth of the city that fell? And this ties in with the 7,000 persons. Some people have a hard time uh, imagining that these 7,000 represent the remaining ones on earth. Uh, but I feel that they do, and I've given my reasons for such. But as we know, 10 is used in the Bible oftentimes as a symbol for something earthly. Seven is heavenly, 10 is earthly. And so a tenth can be earthly as well. For example, the uh, ten horns on the seven-headed wild beast represent the, all the kings of Satan's political system. Uh, Jesus warned his brothers that Satan would keep on throwing them into prison and that they may be tested for ten days. In other words, for the entirety of the time they are on earth before their resurrection to heaven. The ten virgins, five foolish, five wise, they represent all of the called ones who are on earth at the time Christ comes to make the separation. So, if you recall, this 11th chapter of Revelation opened, talking about uh, measuring the temple and so forth, but not the courtyard. And it says, let the nations trample the holy city underfoot for 40 two months. Well, the holy city represents Christ's kingdom. The reason for that is because Christ uh, organized his congregation in the original holy city, Jerusalem. And that's where the apostles uh, were in the upper room when Holy Spirit came down upon them on the day of Pentecost, uh, starting this holy organization. And they remained in Jerusalem for some time. That was their unofficial headquarters, so that represents Christ's anointed congregation. But Jesus said that the holy place and the city would be desolated by a disgusting thing. And that's what it's talking about in that first, second verse, uh, that the nations will trample upon it for 42 months. Well, what happens after that? You recall that the two witnesses witness and torment the nations for 42 months. And then the wild beast that ascends out of the abyss will make war with them and kill them. And the death of the two witnesses is simultaneous with this great earthquake and the 7,000 being killed. The rest of the uh, Christ chosen ones, sealed ones who are on earth at that time. So their death, the death of all the remaining ones, means that there is no holy city left on earth. Christ's congregation is no more on earth. 
that's the end of Christianity, if you want to believe that, because Christianity is focused on collecting out from people of all the nations a kingdom to serve with Christ, uh, a kingdom of priests and uh, kings, 144,000 in number, who will be with Christ in heaven. So when these last 7,000 are killed and join Christ in heaven, that's why there's no more holy city on the earth. The tenth, the earthly part of Christ's congregation is gone. And it's fulfilled its purpose. They, they are with Jesus in heaven. Now, the rest of this chapter will bear that out. Okay, so the second woe is past. The third woe is coming quickly. The seventh angel blew his trumpet. And there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will rule as king forever and ever. And it goes on to say, The 24 elders who were seated before the throne of God fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We thank you, Jehovah God, the Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and begun ruling as king. Well, the Watchtower says that Jehovah began ruling as king in 1914 through his son, of course. Uh, but here is a very important point. Jesus has always been king over his congregation, right? In Colossians, Paul said, you have been transferred into the kingdom of the son of his love by virtue of their being anointed. Transferred under Christ's kingship. He is the head of the congregation and their king. That's why Jesus said, you must be no part of this world. That would constitute subjecting yourself to another king, in essence. Uh, but here, here's the point. Jesus has had his kingship over his uh, congregation. But when does he become king of the world? When is this scripture fulfilled? The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and Christ. And he will rule as king forever and ever. Well, you recall in the sixth chapter of Revelation, the rider of the white horse is given a crown and a bow and he's sent forth to conquer, and he succeeds in his conquest. That is Christ, subjecting the nations and also weeding out of his uh, congregation all things that cause stumbling and persons doing lawlessness, uh, so that in the end, Christ is joined by the true ones. And that is when the kingdom of the world becomes the kingdom of our Lord. Jesus does not begin ruling the world until all of his chosen ones, all of Jehovah's chosen ones, more appropriately, are with him. Once the bride is with Christ and the wedding of the Lamb ensues, that is when Christ's kingdom comes into being fully. And it is at that point, it says the nations became wrathful and your own wrath came, the appointed time for the dead to be judged and to reward your slaves, the prophets, the holy ones, and those fearing your name, the small and the great, and to bring to ruin those ruining the earth. The kingdom doesn't become Christ, and then a hundred years later he brings to ruin those ruining the earth. It's a very short interval. Well, it's interesting how that 11th chapter closes out. And the temple sanctuary of God in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple sanctuary. And there were flashes of lightning and voices and thunders and an earthquake and a great hail. Well, again, hearkening back to the death of Jesus, you recall at the moment he expired, the tent in the temple, which separated the holy from the most holy compartment, a big massive curtain, it was ripped 
down the center, revealing the way to the most holy. And Paul explained that meant Christ's flesh. And by virtue of him allowing his death allows access to Jehovah by those who have been called into the kingdom. So here the temple sanctuary is opened and we see the Ark of his covenant. Now that's very strange because uh, the Ark of the Covenant, we know, uh, Moses fabricated that. It was covered in gold and had uh, these two cherubs hovering over it with their wings. And inside the Ark were the two stone tablets upon which were written the Ten Commandments. And also there were some of the manna that Jehovah provided for the Israelites when they were trekking through the wilderness. Uh, but what happened to that ark? Besides, you know, making a, a blockbuster movie out of uh, the supposed hidden ark. Well, no doubt when the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem, they, they were after the gold, right? And uh, no doubt they took that ark along with all the other utensils and who knows what they did with it. Maybe they got the gold off of it, melted it down, uh, whatever. There's no mention of the ark when the Israelites came back and rebuilt Jerusalem. No mention of the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, Jesus didn't mention it. But the Ark, it, it, of course, in Revelation is a symbol, as all many of the things that, you know, Revelation is the last book in the Bible for a reason because it draws on history and places and people and things. You know, Armageddon is taken from, you know, the Hebrew Megiddo where strategic battles were fought and so forth and so on. So the Ark of the Covenant seen in heaven uh, represents the fulfillment of Jehovah's covenant with spiritual Israel. The covenant that Jesus mediated and concluded by his death, it is fulfilled when all of those bought by Christ, totaling 144,000, are with him in heaven. That's when the temple is opened up to them. They have full access to Jehovah. They see his face. And the, the new covenant is represented by that ark. Being in heaven, it's... It's concluded its purpose. The original ark represented Jehovah's presence, right? Wherever the Israelites took it, Jehovah was there, and it was he was there in the temple. In fact, there was a miraculous light that shone in the most holy compartment down on that ark, the Shekinah light. So opening this temple and the ark there represents the fulfillment of Jehovah's new covenant to produce a new creation of immortals and his presence is there in this temple and the anointed make up the temple remember jesus said if you're faithful i will make you a pillar in the temple of my god so they're part of this institution this kingdom this temple arrangement that worships jehovah day and night and which now at this point rules the world. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Christ. So Christ and his 144,000 begin ruling. The nations fight bitterly against it and are destroyed. And that's, that's what's symbolized by the flashes of thunder and lightning and a great earthquake. Now, Armageddon and God's judgments are completely executed against Satan and his world. So that ends all the opening of the seals, the trumpet blast, and so forth. And when we get into the 12th chapter of Revelation, it sort of goes back in time and fills in some of the things that uh, we would consider vital information to help us appreciate this unfolding of Jehovah's judgments in the near future, I would emphasize. So thanks for watching.